So in the U.S., we're sort of taught to believe that the U.S. is the greatest nation in health. You know, we have the best health here. Um, it's true. I mean, we have, we live longer than most countries. We have the best technology. But are we really healthy? And I've become a bit of a skeptic about that question recently. Um, I look around, I see friends, colleagues, um, people in the family who are anxious. There's sleep disturbances. There, people are depressed. Um, you hear so much about autism and Alzheimer's. Um, there's a lot of disease and a lot of chronic conditions going around and none of these are associated with germs. So I thought to myself, um, when I see all the prescription medicine out there, which is I think 48%, um, are we really healthy? And has something changed in the environment? Or something changed? Has something shifted? So the question was, to identify, could we find that something? And what did you find? <laughs> <laughs> well, so we wrote a paper. I brought a researcher in, Wendy, and uh, we looked at 190 chronic diseases. And um, we thought, you know, let's try to find the fastest growing diseases. And we let, narrowed it down to 40, the 40 fastest growing. Turned out that 39 have more than doubled in the last generation, a 25 year period. So when we looked at these diseases, we said, is there something in common? I mean, we, we first of all, I mean, these diseases are, are popular diseases known to all of us. Alzheimer's, autism, depression, panic disorder, diabetes is in there, hypertension. Some of the interesting things we found is there are no cancers. There's only three out of the 40 were cancers. So cancer is really not growing dramatically like it did in the you know, 90s and the 80s and the 20th century. Uh, there's obviously no contagious diseases or communicable diseases because even though they're chronic, they involve germs. So we're seeing a new class of diseases emerge. In fact, four new categories. Autoimmune is the, probably the biggest one, and that's most people don't really understand what autoimmune disease is, but there's 85 autoimmune diseases. And according to the CDC, it's about 25 million people, could be bigger. So autoimmune disease is skyrocketing. MS is an example, and there's lots of very interesting diseases within the autoimmune spectrum most of us haven't heard of. Um, one of the diabetes is an autoimmune disease. But for the most part, they're very, very arcane diseases. The next category is neurological. And neurological is the most devastating. We know about Alzheimer's, but you also throw autism in there, um, ADDs in that category. And then look at the mental health diseases that have grown. Bipolar, depression, suicide. All these things are growing astronomically. And there's a neurological component. So we look at it as a behavioral thing. We call it mental health. But aren't they really neurological with all these neurological changes? Third category is inflammatory, which covers a lot of these diseases. And the fourth is metabolic, which is about obesity and diabetes. The, the diabetes we most recognize as... Um, as, as the initial di diabetes, diabetes one. So these new categories of diseases have actually defined a new era of disease. And when you look at it, it's huge. 170 million people are suffering from one of these diseases or conditions that we looked at. Remember, cancer and heart disease really aren't very well represented within these 40. These are the 40 fastest growing. Only strokes and hypertension are from the, you know, the uh, heart disease category. So this is something that, you know, I, I was shocked. I was amazed to see this level of disease out there, 170 million people being affected. The cost to society annually is $2.5 trillion. I thought to myself, wow, our national debt, we could reduce the debt in six years if we could get rid of these diseases. It was really exciting to see how these diseases came together and what we wanted to understand is is there a common thread and the initial thing we looked at is oxidative stress which seems to be a prevalent uh, thread between uh, around chronic disease and oxidative stress is the prevalence of free radicals which many of us have heard of and free radicals get set loose in the body and they destroy tissue and they destroy lipids and they destroy proteins they destroy a lot 
So we looked at all 40 diseases and we saw a connection between oxidative stress and these 40 diseases. Then we looked at chronic inflammation, which everyone feels is you know, part, a big part of chronic disease. And it did match the 40. And we continued on and we found four more biofactors. You know, mitochondrial dysfunction, when the mitochondria, the energy center of our bodies and our cells is depleted and the energy center is disrupted. We saw autonomic dysfunction when the autonomic nervous system, the nervous system that we don't control, it's our breathing, it's our pulse, it's our uh, body temperature, uh, it's our heartbeat. These are things, even it's our sex drive. It's, it, you know, it affects so many different things. It's being affected and on and on and on. So we found a disease state, six biofactors that match all 40 diseases. What's the probability that that would happen? There must be something there. So underneath all this, there is a molecule that, keep them, that kept on uh, cropping up. It's called peroxynitrite. And we continue to see peroxynitrite as affiliated with all these diseases and associated with all these biofactors. And we begin to look at peroxynitrite as the heart of chronic disease. Now, this is nothing we discovered. This is something that we saw. It was already existed in the science. And the prime paper on this in 2007 Three great scientists from NIH wrote a paper, and they wrote about nitric oxide and peroxynitrite in health and disease. It's a landmark paper. It's been cited 2,000 times. And this paper talks about peroxynitrite. For the first time, it shows peroxynitrite as the heart of chronic disease, and associates peroxynitrite in this paper with 50 to 60 other diseases, some of which we cover, and some of the diseases we found weren't covered in the paper. This is a devastating molecule. So this sounds like, you know, such a major discovery. Why haven't we heard more about this? Great question. I mean, I am, this is the question I posed to Pal Thatcher, who's uh -huh. the lead scientist at NIH. Um, Pal said that back in 2007, the paper was initially, had a lot of resistance, scientists even, because they were all attached to nitric oxide as being the problem. Nitric oxide is a precursor to peroxynitrate. So you take nitric oxide, NO, you combine it with superoxide, O2, and you get O N O O. But they pointed out that peroxynitrate was really the agent that was creating all these biological uh, mechanisms in the body, disrupting, penetrating the blood brain barrier, lowering the amount of neurotransmitters like dopamine and GABA and others, destroying lipids, which are fats necessary for health and, and survival, interrupting the nervous system and the conveyance of communications through the body. We have a human internet. We do. There's a communication system. It tells the cells what to do. We're communicating all the time. This system is being disrupted. The mitochondria is being disrupted, and on and on and on. In this paper, we included 97 biochemical that's just a fraction. But Pal Patcher said, you know, the, at the time, in 2007, when the paper came out, the pharmaceutical companies began to become interested. They said, okay, can we create something? Can we create a pharmaceutical drug that people can take, reduce peroxynitrate, and possibly reduce all this chronic disease? Now, I don't know all this story, but according to Pal, is they couldn't find a clean enough solution to create a, pr a product they could put on the market. Who knows where it went? But the pharmaceutical industry gave up on peroxynitrite, or scavenging it, they call it scavenger, scavenging peroxynitrite, sometime between 2007 and 2010. So you, you're very sure that this is at the heart of being this disruptor in the body. So, you know, why isn't it that, that some of the uh, pharmaceutical companies is it that they've not identified it this way? Do they need more research? Um... You know, I, again, I haven't investigated why the pharmaceutical companies gave up on this. But the key thing is, in 2007, when we found out, when it became clear to the scientific community that peroxynitrite is at the heart of chronic disease, why didn't we, the public, know? What doctor can spell peroxynitrite? <laughs> I barely can. And I've been working with it. I mean, it's, it's tough. So the pharmaceutical industry could operate in many different ways. Maybe they couldn't find a really good, um, 
a clean delivery for it. But they also may have noticed that in nature, there's probably 20 to 30 natural scavengers. So they may have figured, I mean, vitamin C, this ascorbic acid in mega doses, can actually reduce peroxynitrite in the body. If I'm a pharmaceutical company, am I gonna spend $100 million investigating how to create a pill when somebody may be able to go to their local health store and find a vitamin that can actually scavenge it? Now, not that easy, because even though these scavengers work, it's a delivery system. How do you get, how do you get these vitamins at the cell, to the cellular level? How do you get it? Peroxynitrite operates very quickly, microseconds, You've got to get it there at the right time, and you've got to be able to knock it out before it knocks out something else. So it's, it might be more complex, but the thing that keeps bothering me is we should know about this because now we can take action. And so don't know what the pharmaceutical companies have in mind. And if maybe they've got something up their sleeve, but if peroxynitrites are the heart of chronic disease, we should be doing something.